Now, I'm, I'm very pleased to preside over this inaugural lecture. It's the fourth one of uh, the series this year, but it's in some sense one of a pair. This week, we have Professor Sayers talking on hybrid capitalism and the development of a welfare state in Asia, when Professor Singh will give the vote of thanks. And next week, we have Professor Singh talking on democracy and religious minorities in India, a long-term view, and then Professor Sayers will give the vote of thanks. That, of course, gives Professor Sayers the, the last word, so I'm expe expecting Professor Singh to be very, very complimentary uh, today. I'm sure, actually, this, this one and next week's will be very enlightening indeed. I'm looking forward to them greatly. Professor Sayers will be introduced by his departmental colleague, Tatyan Kong. Dr. Kong is a reader in Comparative Politics and Development Studies in the Department of Politics and International Studies here at Sayers. He received his BA um, from the University of Newcastle, his MPhil, DPhil from Oxford, and his interests are in the politics of economic reform generally and the politics of Korea, both North and South. Vote of thanks will be delivered by Professor Gohapal Singh, who's the Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Humanities here at Sayers. He really needs no introduction. He specialises on Indian politics, the Indian diaspora, religions and developments. He's also published widely on Punjab and Sikh studies, provides regular media coverage on South Asian affairs. And we're very grateful to both of you for being part of today's event. At the end, you'll be invited up to the reception in the Brunei suite for some wine and canapes. That's enough from me to introduce the main event. I'll pass over to Professor Syed, uh, Dr. Kong to introduce Professor Science. Over to you. Well, thanks, Paul. Thanks, audience, for your attendance. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here to celebrate the work of Lawrence Saez, and in particular to be introducing him. And I warmly congratulate Lawrence on his appointment to the post of Professor in the Political Economy of Asia. I've known Lawrence since 2004, when he was a research fellow at the LSE, and then he came to do some teaching for our department. Uh, he joined the department as a full-time member of the faculty in 2007, during my first year as the chair of the Department of Politics and International Studies. So I've known Lawrence for 10 years in the capacity of colleague, co-teacher, and line manager. Um, I can say that Lawrence is a prolific writer on the politics and political economy of South Asia. Uh, his work covers both, both the domestic and the international dimensions and has been published in many high quality outlets. Uh, he teaches courses which are well received by students. Um, his contribution to the department and the school uh, extends well beyond that. Um, he's established, the, he's the person who established the presence of the quantitative approach in our department, an important area in which we were lacking. Uh, this has been of great benefit to our research profile and to the training of the next generation of researchers in the politics of Asia and Africa. He is very entrepreneurial. He is always seeking, seeking out large research grants. Uh, he is active in uh, public engagement through his media commentating and in the participation in policy organizations and policy forums, such as the, uh, he's a, a fellow of Chatham House um, and also he has participated in the World Economic Forum. Um, and uh, last but by no means least, he is always immaculately dressed uh, for his media performances. He is immaculately dressed today. Um, I, uh, this morning in my preparation, I re-watched some of his, some of his uh, YouTube, some of his YouTube interviews. And, you know, I, I would say he is a, he is a sartorial role model for you know for for the for our for our profession um i just came back from korea last night um in the korean language there is an expression uh tanung han saram to describe multi-talented people so lawrence would be a very good example of taje taje tanung tanung han saram uh so he will be a very good example of this in our, in our profession. Um, so to sum up, he is a, he's a valuable asset to our department and to the school, and his appointment is richly deserved. Um, so it's time, 
for Professor Saez to take the stage and deliver his inaugural lecture. Thank you. Just want to make sure that the, this, this thing works, because, uh, okay, good. Okay. Um, well, welcome, uh, those of you who came to, to see me, um, more especially my son, who is um, obviously the, the guest of honor for, in my, in my, um, uh, for this event. Um, obviously, I would like to have to, uh, had my father uh, be here. Uh, unfortunately, he died 25 years ago, so uh, he wouldn't be, but he would have been quite proud uh, of this achievement. Um, it is in interesting, uh, these this dynamics between father and, and son. Um, a few year, uh, weeks ago, we, uh, we were in Moscow, and I heard my son talking on Skype. Uh, I went to sleep, and he was talking to one of his friends on Skype. And <clears throat> I guess his friend asked him, you know, what, what, this, you know, what are you doing in Moscow? And Jackson answered, well, uh, you know, I'm here with my dad. And then I guess the friend asked him, you know, what does he do? And then he said, well, he's a professor. And then I, I couldn't hear what the other person was asking, but the, the next response from Jackson was, um, I'm not quite sure what he teaches. Uh, um, so this is not a, a uncommon. Most people in my department, most of my friends, have no idea what I'm up to. Um, so today I will give you a little bit of an introduction as to what, um, what, I, what I'm working on and the type of things that, that intrigue me. Um, if you're not an academic, uh, don't be put off by the, by the title. Uh, it's, it's somewhat, um, uh, kind of appears to be much more, more, more difficult than it is. It is a fairly simple concept. I'm trying to understand why is it that in some countries in Asia uh, you have um, the, the prospects of a development of a welfare state and why there's variation across different countries in Asia. I mean, it could be summarized in one sentence, but of course it would not be a very interesting lecture to have one sentence lecture, but uh, maybe next time. The, uh, I will talk a little bit about mapping Asia. Uh, especially for those of you who, who are unfamiliar with the area. I'll talk about um, barriers of capitalism, which is important literature in comparative political economy. I will talk about typology of hybrid capitalist market economies that I'll, I'll be looking at. And then I'll talk about the development of a welfare state um, more broadly, but also more specifically um, in Asia. And then I'll suggest, I guess, in the question and answer period, if, if there are questions, uh, about how to, to develop this agenda further. If we're to look, look at um, mapping Asia, generally the way I look at Asia uh, tends to be from a political economist's point of view, uh, but I look a lot at uh, income levels as being a determinant of a, a number of uh, issues in, in, the, in the region. So if you were to look at the World Bank, for instance, they categorize uh, countries according to different types of income, and so you have low-income countries such as the ones on the, on the screen, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, and so on. And so the, the, what I find in my analysis of Asian ec economies is that low-income economies have uh, faced severe challenges that other Asian economies, uh, of which the ones that I'll be looking at in, in, in more, more detail, uh, do not. Uh, these are the uh, different type of categories in terms of uh, lower middle income and upper middle income economies. As you can see, uh, the, 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 the division between lower middle income and upper middle income is actually quite arbitrary. Is defined by the World Bank. And actually, if you look at the amounts, we're talking about $1,000 a year, uh, to $3,975 a year uh, annual income. And you can imagine that, that this area is still quite poor in, in per capita terms. And so you have many countries like Bhutan, Armenia, Indonesia, India that fall into that category of lower middle income economies. Much of my work on, on comparative political economy has been, in fact, motivated and, and enhanced by my, my, my interactions with uh, my colleagues in the department, but especially uh, Tatian Kong, who specializes and analyzes uh, some of these economies that fall into the broad middle income uh, bracket, Con economies that started off poor and became uh, much wealthier over time. Then uh, on the other side of the, of the screen, you find upper middle income economies. Uh, obviously, the one that ca has captured a lot of people's attention is China. I think overwhelmingly students are drawn to understanding China. Obviously, if I were a student, 
I would want to study China. And it, as an academic, I have also done some work trying to compare uh, different uh, outcomes between uh, India and China specifically. Uh, but you find other economies in that, in that bracket. Um, I would point out perhaps Malaysia. I mean, a lot of, there's been a lot of discussion recently about Malaysia, the, the mishaps uh, relating to the, uh, to the lost uh, airplane. Um, but it's still, it's an impressive uh, uh, economy in Asia that, that doesn't get a great deal of attention. It's been, you know, it's, it's almost in, in, a, in a few years uh, will be an upper income economy. Many of these economies, in, both in the lower middle income and the upper middle income bracket, uh, face what, what uh, some uh, comparative political economists refer to as the middle income trap. Namely, they, can, they have a problem in terms of being able to maneuver beyond being middle income. Uh, obviously, uh, we will anticipate that China will surpass that and become an upper middle income economy. And the same thing uh, we will see for, for countries like Malaysia. On the other hand, countries that are middle income economies that are unable to, to overcome that middle income trap uh, may face difficulties. People's expectations of what they would, were, are, is to re, are to receive from the state, for instance, uh, increase. And if the state is unable to, de to deliver, the government is unable to deliver, uh, there are more likely to be uh, problems in terms of, uh, of riots and, and violence. These are the uh, high income economies of which Japan, South Korea, Taiwan. Uh, as I mentioned to you, I mean, in fact, in the, the course that Tatian Kong and I teach, uh, we, we highlight a lot the, the, the miracle, really, of South Korea and Taiwan uh, in terms of the, their, their rapid economic development in the 1960s onwards. When we look at Asia, or political economists look at Asia, um, there are specific characteristics that are intriguing. Uh, I have highlighted a few, uh, six of them. Um, I mean, there could be more. I'm sure that if we were to have a debate about the, or a tutorial about the, what is characteristic about Asian economies um, and, and, and the way in which they in, engage in capitalist activities, uh, we could come up with more. However, I guess, uh, for, for the purpose of, of, of keeping the discussion short, uh, I looked at six um, colonial legacies. Um, the, the ethnic links and commercial activity is quite important in Asia. Uh, the, the, the role of the state, of the government, in, uh, in, in, uh, in directing capitalist activity is important. You find that many Asian economies have uh, an important role of the military in terms of how the, how the economy actually works. And you, if you analyze specific economies, you find that the military is actually pretty much the, the dominant player in that economy. For instance, Pakistan, to use an example. Uh, technology clusters and democratic regime types uh, are, are peculiar to the way that, that uh, capitalism has developed in Asia. And uh, most importantly, I guess from the point of view of my own work, which is where, uh, where, where this lecture is heading, is really to discuss the welfare state regime, namely um, the development of a welfare state, as you find perhaps in Scandinavian countries and most uh, advanced uh, Western economies. In terms of the colonial legacy, uh, many of you who, who, who are analysts of the, of the region, obviously this would be fairly, fairly, fairly basic, uh, but it has uh, what I think is distinctive about um, Asian uh, capitalism is that there are episodes of internal colonialism, namely some uh, Asian countries colonizing other Asian uh, countries, and that is quite uh, unusual. You don't find, for instance, Western countries uh, colonizing each other necessarily, like France colonizing Germany and so on. But you do find examples, for instance, of Japan being a colonial presence in other Asian economies, and as a result of that, having a great impact on the development of, uh, of, of uh, industry, for, for, for instance, in, in those countries. And also those, those internal colonial powers also uh, competed with uh, European colonial powers. And so that, that dynamic creates a distinctive set of characteristics for, for Asian economies. Um, colonial powers, uh, you could argue, assisted in the development of capitalism by providing a high, highly centralized bureaucracy in some instances, uh, and by providing some re regulatory framework for economic activity. Much of the, the analysis of the work that I do uh, looks at institutional development, um, and you find that those countries that have uh, stronger institutions, uh, often as a result of uh, colonial uh, presence, uh, are able to be much more successful than those that don't have that. Another uh, interesting feature about uh, capitalism in Asia is the, the, the role of ethnic links. Um, is this is an area that really is not fully studied, and in in hopefully in the, in the future this will be um, much more uh, analyzed much more critically. But capitalism in Asia is, is, is uh, embedded, as I argue, 
within the prism of ethnicity. You find many Asian countries where, uh, for instance, the Chinese community may be a dominant player in the economy. Uh, in some instances, they're, they're the, 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 the dominant player, but it's still perhaps not, not fully uh, recognized in terms of political uh, engagement. Uh, in, in, in Sri Lanka, to use another example, you find uh, Tamils, uh, Tamils who were uh, uh, overwhelmingly educated relative to the rest of the population and having a great impact on, on the type of relations internally, ethnically, uh, and, and, and the type of activities that take place <clears throat> in terms of trade and commerce. And then you also find that uh, ethnic links are important in terms of ethnic diasporas, and you find many, for instance, in, in many Asian countries, uh, the role of Chinese ethnic diasporas assisting each other, uh, and also in the development of uh, family-owned firms. It's kind of an unusual uh, characteristic of Asian uh, countries. You also find that the state, uh, I, I mean, uh, many of my colleagues know that, uh, at least ideologically, I guess, if it were, um, I have kind of some, some sympathies for what is referred to as uh, neoliberal institutionalism. It's something that actually most aggravates most of my colleagues, but um, I do, uh, I'm aware uh, that the state is quite important in economic activity, and especially in Asia, uh, where it, it, it has assisted in the, the formulation of national policy in some countries, investment promotion, and so you, f uh, you find that Asia is unique in that respect, say, compared to other parts of the world where it's not that present in, in, in actually enabling a positive economic engagement in, in, in development in those areas. Much of the, the work that Tatian Kong, for instance, uh, has done in, in engages with this specific facet of, of state-directed uh, capitalist activity. The role of the military, um, f f uh, f I mean, from my point of view, uh, an unfortunate uh, involvement in, in many countries uh, for which it is involved, um, but you do find that, uh, given that the, the authoritarian regimes in, um, with weak political institutions is, is a feature of many Asian countries, um, the role of military is an important one. And so it becomes a central in the way in which many countries, uh, to use an example, Thailand, uh, the, the military forms a, a key part of economic activity and, and plays a part in who is, is, is the, in, in power and who is out of power in that specific state. So it forms part of what in political science we refer to as a political coalition that maintains authoritarian regimes uh, and, 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 and power. The involvement of the military as a critical actor in economic activity is well known. It's been studied uh, from country to country, uh, Pakistan being one of the most notable examples. But then you also find that the military was quite critical in, the, in, in, uh, in Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand. Uh, and most recently in Myanmar or, or Burma. So that is something that you don't find in other countries where the, where the, 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 the economic activity of the, of the military is so, so central to, to, to capitalist development. We also find, uh, or I find that, um, that you find that, the, that early industrializers um, have moved in the direction of greater consolidation of democracy. Uh, this is something, uh, in my view, quite positive. Uh, but you do find that is, there's a link between uh, technology development in some areas and democratic uh, regime types. This is a slide, for instance, from one of my star students at SOAS. Um, I have a, actually, I have a lot of quibbles with, with her, the way that she, she presented the, the specific um, uh, set of, of, of countries. But her argument, which I think is, 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 is an intriguing one, she worked for The Economist, and so she tried to pull data from, from The Economist and, and to try to make an argument about uh, low-income economies of the type that I described before, low, middle, and high-income economies, and in terms of the, 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 the quality of the technology in terms of, the, of, 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 of those countries. And so her argument, which I think is fairly, I mean, it's a fairly linear uh, one, uh, is that uh, countries that, that, that are high-income countries also are likely to have high le levels of, of technology. But most importantly, <laughs> you do find that those countries move away from, from authoritarianism over time. Um, in some cases, they never were authoritarian uh, at all. But over time, you find that even those countries that, that initially uh, began uh, a, trans a transition towards a high levels of economic development uh, also begin to move at, at some point away from, from authoritarian uh, regimes. Uh, this would anticipate, my, my reading of this would be that over time, um, a country like China uh, not only on, on this basis, but among other, uh, other areas, 
uh, you would anticipate that China at some point will become democratic. And if you want to have a bold prediction from me about this, it would be that it, within our lifetime, we'll see a transformation of that type uh, in China. <clears throat> Other countries, uh, for instance, those that are low-income economies, also have low levels of, um, of, of, of technology quality. And also, they, they're, they're, they tend to be embedded in, in authoritarian systems. And so they, they have difficulties pulling away from, from, that, from that structure. Finally, uh, the other characteristic of, of Asian economies is the, um, the role of the welfare state, as we know it in the West. Um, normally, cross-national evaluations of state-funded uh, welfare provision show that Asian countries have not developed a, a, a significant welfare state public goods. In other words, the state does not provide a great deal of, of, of welfare provision, say for instance, uh, assistance to the elderly, unemployment compensation, that type of thing that, that we, we would anticipate in, uh, in, in many uh, advanced developed economies. Uh, the percentage of public health expenditures as, a, as the overall proportion of health expenditures, for instance, is 44.2% in Asia, well below the world average of 62.8%. So you do find that, that the state is not a great provider of that specific type of public good. Uh, there are also uh, differences. Uh, this is, I mean, it may be kind of tedious, but it's something that I'm trying to, to develop into a, an article for uh, Comparative Politics, which is one of the leading journals in uh, political science. I'm trying to kind of highlight the differences in the types of welfare state provision in across different Asian countries. Some of them which emphasize provident funds, such as Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore, and others that emphasize uh, social insurance, such as Japan, Korea, Philippines, Taiwan, uh, and Thailand, uh, mostly uh, stressing educational expenditure. So you do find some differences within Asia, and, 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 the, and it, which, which denotes that the state is trying to has specific strategies in how it allocates resources to different uh, sectors, in this case, health or education. Um, there are links to literature. I mean, this is mostly for my colleagues who always uh, want a, a theoretical link to the literature. Most, most people who, are, who are, don't work in academia don't care whether there's any theory behind uh, what is being said. But generally, uh, much of the work that, that, that links to, the, to, to, the, to that my work engages is with is what's referred to as the varieties of capitalism literature um, that tries to un understand within the political, comparative political economy framework um, differences in different forms of, of, of capitalism. One of the main books in this specific area that, that has sparked a great deal of literature on, the, on this front is the, the work by uh, Hall and Saskas in other areas of capitalism. I have tried to engage that, uh, in that, with that work focusing on India, which is one of the, my specialist countries. Within the framework of the various capitalism uh, literature, uh, ca ca uh, they, they classify capitalist economies according to five criteria in terms of industrial relations, vocational training and education, corporate governance, what they refer to as interfirm relations, and then the, the relations between employee, essentially employee relations. And so they, they, what they, the authors do is to try to look at and see different uh, countries in the world and see to what level, to what within what framework do they fit? Um, are they closer to what they refer to as a com uh, coordinate market economy where the state directs uh, economic activity or are they more geared towards what they refer to as a liberal market economy uh, which enables um, private sector actors to be much more engaged? And so these are kind of the, some of the, the basic differences between what they refer to as liberal market economies and coordinate market economies. Namely, they, they discuss, they, 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 they they argue that, that uh, in liberal market economies, such as the US and the UK, you have uh, competitive interfirm relations, flexible labor markets, namely you can hire and fire people much more freely, low levels of unionization, and high income inequality. That's sort of some of the features that they, they, they identify with liberal market economies. On the other hand, uh, you find, or they find, uh, coordinate market economies, mostly uh, Scandinavian countries, Germany, France, where they argue that there are uh, collaborative uh, interfirm relations, rigid labor markets, in other words, it's, it's hard to fire or uh, hire or fire somebody, and higher levels of unionization, membership in unions, and then low income inequality. Among these features, the ones that, that intrigue me uh, in my analysis of, of, of the welfare state provision are the low levels versus high levels of unionization which will become one of, perhaps one of the explanatory variables in terms of what happens as to why in some countries in Asia, you do find some levels of welfare state development in that and others. 
However, uh, and I think my, my colleagues uh, who work on this area and I uh, tend to believe that, that this basic framework of, of dividing the world into a coordinated or liberal market economies does not really fit uh, Asian economies, primarily among some of the conditions that I mentioned to you before, some of the characteristics that make Asian countries much more distinctive. There are no pure models of liberal market or coordinated market economies in, in exa examples in Asia. Um, we, we do find high levels of state involvement with selected um, business conglomerates, for instance, the Chavos in South Korea, Kiritsu in, in Japan, and so on, which, which kind of fits somewhat closer to the coordinated market economy, but they're not uh, fully uh, good examples of that. Uh, we do find uh, in, in, in analysis of Chavos-style uh, business conglomerates, which are family-owned, highly centralized, horizontal, but they're not able to uh, own their own financial institutions. And that creates a set of, of, of um, relationships that are distinctive that, to what you would anticipate in a coordinated uh, market economy model. Uh, also, the, the Japanese-style uh, uh, um business conglomerates are led by professional managers. They're highly decentralized with the ability to, to own their own uh, financial institutions. And so also that creates a set of distinctiveness that, that you don't find in, in Western um, uh, conglo uh, business conglomerates. The state also is uh, typically does not encourage in, 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 Asian, in many Asian countries um, open competition for new market entrants. And so this is something that uh, if you were to, to, to analyze them in terms of looking at uh, the US, for instance, where in some sectors you do find the state trying to prevent new market entrants, new, new competitors, and Asia is much more, more fully developed. So on the, on the basis of this, um, we don't think, or I don't think that there is a, um, a good model of liberal market economy, co coordinated market economy in Asia. And so we talk about uh, uh, hybrid models, essentially something that, is, that combines the elements about liberal market economy in a coordinated market economy. So what are the, you know, if you were to identify what are the characteristics of a hybrid uh, capitalist market economy, uh, namely there's something that is not either a coordinated market economy or a liberal market economy is kind of some third um, element. You could perhaps extend it further and say that, that a coordinated market economy could lead to some sort of hypothetical pure socialist state and a liberal market economy would, would come closer to a, a pure capitalist state. And so in, in this framework, a hybrid market economy is somewhere in between, combining both the elements of the coordinated market economies and then of the liberal market economies. And so in some instances, when you look at different countries in Asia, they could go in either direction closer, or kind of a model that's closer to the coordinated market economy model that, that is illustrated uh, before, or closer in some instances, like Hong Kong, to use an example, to the liberal market economy models that, that we were familiar with. There are many types of uh, hybrid capitalist market economies. Uh, each one, I think, mer would merit a whole lecture in terms of the, the, the differences, the characteristics of them, the, the effects of having uh, to, to live under one of these types of, of economies. Generally, you find some sort of um, kind of uh, transition from some, uh, some uh, socialist market economies, for instance, uh, Vietnam, towards perhaps a state uh, capitalist economy. There's a great deal of, of focus now on China as being a, rule, a model of a state capitalist economy. Um, as I mentioned to you before, uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Kong, he worked, uh, has in fact, I would say probably one of the uh, world leaders in terms of the analysis of capitalist development economies um, such as ta uh, Taiwan and South Korea. And then you find also uh, what are uh, facets of chronic capitalism in most Asian economies, um, in, in, in some sense undermining the capacity of private, the private sector to actually generate growth. The characteristics are uh, extensive of uh, hybrid market economies. Namely, uh, once again, that the state acts as an important economic actor, um, that the state exercises a considerable influence over the allocation of credit uh, and investment. The state, uh, some sort of planning body, uh, centralized planning body, uh, tends to direct industrial and agricultural, and agricultural policy. You do find the presence of corporatized government and state-owned firms in these uh, Asian economies, you find it less and less in, in advanced uh, uh, Western economies. <clears throat> the state coordinates uh, uh, strategic and economic activity in collaboration with these private, uh, with favored privately owned firms. Business activity in hybrid market economies uh, 
uh, is heavily regulated by the state. Um, the state also directs private firms to provide uh, significant public services uh, of the types that normally the state would provide, such as health and education and the type of uh, uh, transfer, welfare transfers that I discussed before. Generally, in, in hybrid market economies, the private sector is, provided, uh, is protected by a by legal system, but it's, it's, it's a fairly tenuous protection. And so, you, it, it, so it makes it difficult to then determine whether private property actually exists in some of these cases. Entrepreneurial capitalist activities are allowed in certain sectors of the economy. I think the example of the IT sector in India would be one of such, but whereas other sectors are heavily restricted. And so, so it's, it's somewhat by chance that you find this uh, more liberalized sector in some countries, in some areas, than in others. And in some instances, the, the state encourages, in some cases even mandates, makes it, makes it mandatory for labor union membership to occur. And so those are some of the characteristics of hybrid market economies of which many Asian economies would, would fit that profile. So um, how does this link to the development of a welfare state, which is the core of what I'm trying to, to discuss? Um, much of the, uh, of the literature on the development of a welfare state focuses on the importance of labor unions. Um, uh, in fact, we, we live and we're going to live through many strikes. Labor unions uh, provide a, a, a direct demands in that, in, that, in that way. And you find that this is one of the, the, um, the arguments that is made as to why in some cases you have countries that have more advanced welfare states than others, namely on the strength of labor unions. Um, and in other cases, however, the expectation is that labor unions are not likely to be actors capable of issuing demands if their labor unions are weak. So if you have weak labor unions, people don't belong to a union, then they're, uh, they're, they're unlikely to issue demands on the state. And that the state is, has no incentive to then uh, provide welfare benefits of any type. And then there, there's literature re relating to the support of labor unions and industrialists for specific types of, of reforms. Um, in this case, in the, 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 the cited author, in terms of support for democracy, but you, you could spread this uh, further uh, to also discuss um, support for a specific types of economic reforms, including reforms to provide more welfare uh, pro provisions. What we find uh, in Asia is that there's uneven uh, levels of uh, unionization across Asia. Uh, in some countries, you find that it's, it's quite high. It's almost 100% mandatory, uh, because in many cases, it's mandatory. In other countries, uh, unionization is quite weak. Um, normally, most Asian economies have had weak welfare states, um, uh, as I mentioned to you before. I illustrated this um, before. Um, and, but there's a growing trend towards welfare provision by the state. Uh, if I were to make a guess as to what's going to happen in Asia in terms of welfare provision over, over time, I would anticipate that more, more countries will move towards a social democratic model, as you would find perhaps in um, and welfare provision, as you find in Scandinavian countries, or at least moving in that direction, perhaps. Um, upper and middle income and upper income Asian states have an incentive to develop a, a full-fledged welfare state, uh, partly because uh, of the inherent inequalities that capitalist activity tends to generate. As uh, some people become wealthier uh, as a result of economic uh, capitalist activity, you find there are growing inequalities. And in some, some countries and many governments in Asia are quite concerned about the, the unrest that could emerge from that. And so as a payoff, uh, and normally you find some sort of welfare provision uh, to, to, to address that. So concerns about political stability and uh, also as a, partially as a result of labor union strength you find that perhaps on those, in some countries in Asia you would find an incentive towards greater welfare provision. So you, <clears throat> to, to move more in the direction of concluding, and I have to mention this because uh, the catering wants to know when am I going to stop talking, so I'm not sure if Tom is here. And so uh, if you're here, the 20 minutes are up. Um, food is important so, and, uh, and drink is important, so uh, don't worry, it will come soon. So there's variation in welfare provision across Asia. Um, this chart is, is unfortunately quite hard to read. Uh, um, for some reason, uh, I, I'm obsessed with it. In fact, I've been spending, I would say, uh, an inordinate amount of time trying to fill in the blanks that you find. But you find, if you were to have supersonic eyesight, you would find uh, on one side, you find Asian economies of the types that the World Bank defines as, as being Asian economies. You would find 
years over time. Um, in fact, much of the work, uh, this is something that uh, I'm quite excited about. Uh, a lot of the work on, in terms of the um, uh, of welfare provision is actually done uh, is, is kind of an initiative at SOAS, um, the Social Welfare in, uh, Social Protection Index. One of the more exciting things that I have seen uh, my colleagues produce that relates to my own work, and, and it, it comes from from. Uh, so I will try to engage with them uh, a bit further. But I want to do my own analysis first and see how it coincides with their own um, assessment of uh, state protection, of social protection. But if you were to look at the figures. Uh, you would find some countries where, where the, the, the provision, uh, namely in terms of social uh, uh, security and welfare, as a, as a proportion of total government expenditure is quite high. In some cases, for instance, you know, 30%, uh, for instance, you find Japan in this specific example. I can't even read the numbers myself, so I'm just going to guess. Uh, but you do find other countries where it's quite low, um, close to 10%. Um, and so this variation uh, for, for comparative political economists is quite intriguing. Why is it that you find in, in country A, Cambodia, a lower level of welfare provision than a country that is quite similar, in, in, in terms, perhaps in terms of income? What is it that makes that, 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 that variation? And so there are perhaps several explanations. Um, I would call them hypotheses. Uh, not, I'm not, the work is not fully developed to the state where I could actually formalize them as, as a hypothesis, but generally there are four potential explanations to why you find that variation. Um, one explanation is that authoritarian regimes are more capable of, of directing investment for welfare expenditure. If, you're, if you don't have to answer to anyone, you can direct investment and allocate it in the way that you want, and so that could be done in form of welfare provision. So that could be one explanation, a kind of political, political science explanation. An alternative one would be that democratic regimes are more responsive to popular demands, and, and those demands typically come, especially in countries that are poor, uh, for redistribution. Namely, poor people want wealth redistributed, and so they, they, they make demands on the state to, to ma make that possible through taxation or some other form. So that could be another explanation for the variation. And then um, another uh, potential explanation that links to the literature that I addressed before is that you have some countries that have high levels of unionization and they're more likely to make demands on the state and accordingly the state rewards them with welfare pay payoffs. And finally, the last one is that, uh, that you need um, perhaps a, um, a high level of income to actually afford a welfare provision. Uh, and so high income countries are more likely perhaps to, to afford expensive welfare uh, uh, expenditure programs. As, as, as we find uh, in, in the development of welfare states in, in the West, um, welfare provision expands over time. It becomes quite, <coughs> sorry, quite central in fiscal provisions. And so that, you anticipate that, that only a state that is, has the capacity to do that uh, is able to, to provi provide that uh, in a sustainable level. In other countries that we have seen in the past, for instance, uh, Argentina, to use an example, where welfare provision was quite extensive, if, if the state doesn't have the resources to actually provide for that welfare, typically you find that those states uh, falter. <clears throat> if we were to look at a modern country, I think that Venezuela, for instance, is facing the same problem. Namely, they have very generous welfare provision, uh, provisions, but then the state doesn't have the capacity to actually afford them. And so you anticipate that over time, those economies will, uh, will collapse. <coughs> so what's my conclusion? Uh, this is the, if, if I had a drum, this would be the one that, that will lead you to, to see what is it that is leading to the variation in welfare provision in different Asian countries. And this is the outcome of a great deal of research. This is the, the moment in which you can go, ooh, oh, this is very exciting. Um, what, I, what I found, I, have, I tried to, to, to look at different um, ways of analyzing the data that I had, that, 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 that unreadable chart that I had before, and compiling in a way that makes sense. My conclusion is that um, union density, union density is, is a measure of, of union uh, participation in labor unions in countries, combined with per capita income. And so if you have union density on its own, it doesn't really tell you much of a story, but if, it, if you combine it with per capita income, so namely countries with high levels of unionization and that are also wealthy are likely to develop a welfare provision much more clearly than those that are poor and, uh, or that have also a combined 
uh, low levels of unionization. So if you have a country with low levels of unionization that is poor, it is unlikely that the state would also provide uh, for welfare provision. And so the, the outcome of this that you find some that the countries in Asia over time will be moving in the direction as to what you would anticipate uh, um, Western developed countries to, to, to generate in terms of welfare provision combined with union density. Um, so this is the, um, I could say, the, 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 the thrust of my work. Um, I'm, I'm sure that, that uh, many of you will, will, will ponder these this ideas. Uh, I thank you for your attention and your patience. And um, I think that I have uh, Gurhapal Singh come next to, to, to close the ceremony. Thank you.